Welcome back, everybody, to our new series of podcasts for the Road and Racing website here in the Rolex Drivers Club at the 2016 Goodwood Revival. And we'll be doing these uh, throughout the weekend, and uh, I hope very much that you'll stay with us, especially as we have with us today, right now, Karun Chandok, fresh from Channel 4 Television, where you've become a bit of a star in the, in the, in the pit lane, a whole, a whole new career, man. Um, well, thank you very much for saying that. Um, but it's been nice coming out of Goodwood and actually seeing people from within the sport who yeah. actually have been very complimentary of, of the work. And obviously, you, you know, you've watched many, many races and many oh, different yes. broadcasters yourself. Um, uh, but you know, it's nice to hear people like Derek Bell and yeah. um, uh, Jackie. You know, you know, people like that who, who. Um, you know, the, their opinion matters in the sport, yeah. and um, yeah, it was, it was, it's always nice to hear. We must talk to you, though, about Karun Chantok, the racing driver, first of, for, first of all, because, I mean, that's where it all came from. And actually, I don't think many people really know how it all came to happen in Madras all those years ago. Yep. I mean, it's a hell of a long way from Browns Hatch and Silverstone. Yeah. Yeah, indeed it is. You know, I think, um, you know, what, what you have to understand is that we don't have a motorsport culture, or, you know, or we didn't. It's a bit better now. Yeah. But uh, there's, there's a reason why only two Indians out of 1.3 billion have made it to Formula One and only one has ever made it to Le Mans. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, uh, while I feel very proud to be yeah. in that exclusive club of two <laughs> and one, um, you know, it's still a bit disappointing, really, if you look yeah. at the size yeah. of the country uh, and economically, you know, we're not a, we're not a small, weak country, no, but a strong, no. eco you know, uh, economic power. So it, it is a bit odd, but I think it's the culture isn't there. Uh, I was fortunate. I grew up in a family where motorsport did exist. My my yeah, grandfather used to race. My grandmother used to race really? in, in the old Hindustan ambassadors, <laughs> really? sort of like a Morris Oxford. Yes. And uh, of course, my dad then raced and rallied a lot yeah. since the seventies. So I, I grew up in that environment. Um, you know, my father went on to run race teams and and then ran the Indian Grand Prix for Bernie and uh, for those three years. So w we were always involved in motorsport, yeah. um, and that's where my my interest started really. How did you make? that break though Karun from from what you've just described yeah. to coming to Europe and let's let's face it I mean getting to Formula One that's a big deal yeah my, my dad um, was very clear that in order for me to climb up the ladder we had to get me to Europe very yeah. quickly yeah. so we did a season of racing in India in the national championship and I won that and then we raced in Asia in what was called the Formula Asia series yeah. Uh, and I won that uh, and then moved to the UK to do Formula 3 and that was a massive shock to the system yes. you know all of a sudden you've gone from 40 degree track temperature where the tires are hot from turn 3 to you know black ice on the track at Alton Park and a cold winter's day and you know I crashed a lot of cars and didn't really understand what to do the first six months of 2002 when I first came here were a bit of a nightmare really um, you know but as the season went on, I learned a lot. I, you know, I had a good team of people around me at T-Sport, and they taught me a lot about how to drive in the rain. I'd never driven in the rain before, yeah, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, things like that were very educational. Um, F3 was tough because I was up against opposition where at the time there was no testing restriction, and we didn't have a big budget, you know, and people like Nelson Piquet and Adam Carroll, you know, excellent drivers but they were doing double the mileage that we were doing. Yeah, yeah. Didn't really probably have a chance. double the money. Yeah, exactly. So uh, then at the end of uh, 2004, I had no budget. You know, I did half a season of F3. I did a little bit of World Series. 2005, did a bit of A1GP, a bit of World Series. Just no budget. Whatever I had a bit of money to do a race, I did. It wasn't the way to go racing, but it was just a way to keep going. Sure. And in 06, I went back to Euro, uh, to, so I went back to Asia to race in the Formula Renault V6 Championship, and I won that. <laughs> and, and that was a very important period for me, that six months at the end of 2006. Uh, I came to England in September just to go to a friend's wedding and to go to a Formula 3 race and just see old friends. And I went to see Bernie. Uh, <laughs> and by that stage, we'd started doing business with him for the television rights in India. And Bernie was very kind to me. He always gave me time. You know, any time, even today, if I call, he always you know, and I say I want to come by and have a coffee. You know, I can walk into his office. Yeah. He's always been very good to me. 
So I went in September and I said, look, Bernie, I'd like to get to F1. This is the situation I'm in. We haven't got a budget. Can't, you know, really, I need to get to Europe. I'm racing in Asia. Uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and he said, well, go win this championship and then call me and we'll see if we can do something. Uh, so I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I won the championship in and then I called him in October and I said, you know, what do you think? Didn't hear from him. A week went by. He said, let me, let me have a think. A week or two went by and didn't hear anything. And then I, my dad got a call and said, there's a cheap E2 test in Jerez, day after tomorrow. Can you get Karun to get to Jerez? And I was in Madras. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bought a ticket. The only seats available were in first class, highly expensive. Anyway, broke the credit card, um, jumped on a plane, got to Jerez, did the test, went reasonably okay. But I wasn't ready. I wasn't fit enough. I wasn't ready for it. It just totally out of the blue. And then, uh, anyway, Adrian Campos, it was with Campos Racing, yeah. and Adrian Campos, very nice man, uh, become a dear friend, and he offered me a drive, but obviously we needed Bernie to help out financially, I couldn't do it. The whole winter went and didn't hear anything from Bernie. You know, he would call and talk to my dad about TV and about Grand Prix and things like that. And whenever we'd say, Bernie, what about the GP2 ride? Oh, yes, 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 I must do something. Nothing. January went and then we went into February and I spoke to a friend of mine at Double R Racing um, and said can I have a job being a team manager of your F3 team because I wanted to work in motorsport sure. and uh, we talked about it and I said okay we, what do I need to do for work permits and to live in the UK and all so we started that sort of process and um, I said to it was Anthony Hyatt or, or Boyo as he's well known uh, he, I told him, I said, okay, give me a couple of weeks. If I can't get a deal, I'll take the job. And uh, then all of a sudden, Bernie called and said, right, there's a deal on the table with Durango. It's the last seat going in GP2. You have 72 hours to get to Italy um, because Red Bull had decided to put me on their driver program. And he, Bernie then did the deal with Durango. I didn't know any of the commercials. His lawyers did the contract. I never saw any of it. Uh, uh, and I was away and, and back at GP2. And from there then, you know, it was yeah. um, a more straightforward path to F1. But that, as I said, that critical six months, uh, I'll always be grateful to Bernie. You know, he's got lots of critics and he's by no means he's an angel. But I'll always be grateful to Red Bull uh, for giving me the opportunity. They gave me my first F1 test. Yeah. And, um, you know, and gave me a chance to race GP2. I think a lot of us, actually, to be honest, had a, had a great deal of, I don't know, respect, admiration for you when you took that drive in Formula One with HRT because, of course, it was a wonderful opportunity for you. You're on the Grand Prix grid, an amazing journey. But, I mean, boy, that, that, car, uh, was, that, that car really was... It, 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 it was it was a real shame to me what happened that 2010 with HRT is a lost opportunity um, when I went to Dallara to do the seat fit I, and I know the people at Dallara very well I've known them for many years they showed me the CFD and the wind tunnel models of what the car could have been and there was another 60 or 70 points of downforce now 60 or 70 points of downforce would have brought us into Toro Rosso territory and would have made us a very respectable sort of back end of the midfield team, but clearly ahead of everybody else. But then issues happened with, you know, the owners of Hispania and Colin Collis, who was running it, and yeah. Delara, they all had a fallout. <laughs> and and it, in the end, the car that Bruno and I took to Bahrain was the car that was only meant to go to a hotel in, in, um, in Spain. As a show a, car. As a show car, as a launch. And we effectively raced the show car spec for the whole season. It wasn't even the testing spec. You know, they had an update for what for what should have been testing. And then they had an update for what should have been the race package. And, um, you know, we were promised an update for Barcelona, an update for Silverstone, a low downforce package for Spa Monza, and none of it materialized. And, and, and it's a real shame because if you look at it, it now, fast forward to 2016, and Delaro have made the car for Haas, yeah, make yeah, no yeah, mistake. Yeah, yeah. Haas have arrived, scored points in their yeah. first two Grand Prix. Yeah. And I think that's something that could have been achieved 
back in really? 2010. That's amazing. It's so interesting talking about it now because at the time, you were, you never said things like that. No, I, I couldn't, you know. And it's a, uh, as I say, it's a real shame. And, and also, you know, if you, I look now at in hindsight at the people in that engineering office, some fantastic people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, work. my race engineer Richard Connell now works at Mercedes. He's yeah. One of the senior guys at yeah, HPP, really, yeah. um, Tony Chikorea has gone on to Ferrari and ran race engineering there for them last year. Um, uh, Jeff Willis, you know, yeah. one of the key architects of yeah. all the Mercedes success. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chevy Pujola ran That's Max Verstappen. People. You great. know, some very very clever people yeah. in that engineering office. And again, they they they. Uh, I don't want to use the phrase polished or you know what, but but they did a good job to make do with what we had. Were you disillusioned? I mean, you. This was a boyhood dream. I mean, you. Yeah. You know, uh, he, here you are. You're a Formula One driver, but yeah. you're going nowhere. How, how how did you kind of cope with that? In the sense that, from that point, you you weren't going to get get into. No, uh, to be honest, in 2010, everyone knew the situation we were in. You yeah. know, we were, were the first lap I drove in the car was in qualifying, and in fact, DC, you know, DC and I were just talking about it, saying, you know, he and Eddie Jordan came to speak to me and saying, uh, are you sure you're, this is a good idea before qualifying on the BBC? And uh, I, I just got on with it. And I think because everyone knew it was a tough situation, we had, you know, we, we had certain races where we could punch above our weight and show our potential. You know, I beat um, the two Virgin racing cars in a straight fight in Montreal. Yeah. Um, you know, I beat Lucas and sorry, I beat Timo and Bruno in yeah. Valencia, you know, there's yeah. certain races where, were, yeah, where on a straight fight we could beat people yeah. in better cars yeah. and, and that showed some potential. Yeah. I wasn't disillusioned then, when I really got disillusioned with Formula One was the following year. Lotus? Or? At Lotus, at Caterham Lotus, because what happened to me... Well, there was a lot of hype for a start, wasn't there? It was, and, and you know, I had a contract and I thought the people involved were honourable people and the contract wasn't upheld. It took me a long time to get compensated you know, financially it was a big battle and eventually they paid what they were meant to, but that wasn't the point. You know, I signed with, I had other options to be a test and reserve driver in the further up the grid, but I signed with Tony Fernandez and, and Lotus yeah. at the time because I was promised a certain number of Grand Prix, yeah. including the Indian Grand Prix. And uh, that was a key part to sway my decision because Racing is racing, you know, testing is fine, but racing is racing. And if there was an opportunity to do some racing, yeah. I was always going to take it. And yeah. that contract wasn't honored. I, yes, I got to do a race in Germany, but uh, it was meant to be multiples. And uh, they, I, I walked at the end of 2011, I was very disillusioned mm. with Formula One. And really, I didn't want to hear anything about F1 at that stage. I, I was just... But it was tough because the media all wanted to know. In India, you know, when you're yeah. one of only two drivers, they all want to know what you're doing. Yeah. And uh, there were a lot of people who supported me and backed me along the way who wanted to know. And all of a sudden, how do you tell these people you're, yes. you're, you're no, you no longer feel in love with the sport yeah, yeah, that you yeah, spent yeah, tough, yeah. 25 years it's being tough, in love yeah. with? Tell us, um, what happened to the Indian Grand Prix Karun? Um, it was fairly straightforward, to be honest. The government never supported it. Um, you know, why, why not? Uh, uh, look, India has lots of socioeconomic issues, and I, I think a Grand Prix is fairly low on our priority list, why? if because I'm perfectly honest. Because, because for the majority of the population, it seems so... It's an inaccessible sport, yeah. you know. And But I think sport in, in, in general in India is badly organised. You know, if you look at the the way all of the sporting federations are run, including cricket, inc including cricket, cricket, it's highly political. But we're successful because a lot of people play, and we have a lot of people. But you know, we have 1.3 billion people, and we got two medals at the Olympics. You know, that's uh, that, that's not a great strike rate. I think we've only ever had one gold medal in the history of the Olympics, and that tells you something about how sport is organised. You know, I think Team GB this year showed that if you have the right funding and the right organization and the right structure and the yeah, right yeah, training, yeah. you can produce athletes yeah. to, to do amazing things. Yeah. And I think it's the same. And in, in our sport, again, for whatever reason, motorsport isn't recognized as a sport in India. It, it, the government actually classified as entertainment. And uh, therefore, it never got the government backing. 
so it had to be privately funded, which the promoters of the race were willing to do up to a point and up to a stage. But they couldn't have been expected to do it in the long term, no, and, no, sure. and that was the end of that. Would it have made a difference if Chandhok had been on the front row? That you know, the I think so. I, I think I look at um, you know what happened in Germany when Michael yeah. rose to prominence. Spain well, with Fernando and Verstappen with Holland. And Verstappen, with, I mean, when you look at Spa this year, yeah, the incredible. number of Dutch people, it was incredible. Yeah. But in that same vein, you know, look at look at the UK. You know, now Jens is not going to be on the grid next year. No. What will the British Grand Prix be like when Lewis goes? Well, when Lewis goes, that will be a problem. It'll yeah. be a big problem. You know, you know, historically the crowds have come to Silverstone yeah, yeah. to support the home driver as they should yeah. and. You know, you've had some great race winners over the years, but I think it will be a big problem. So, conversely, to answer your question, yes, I think if I had the opportunity to drive in a car uh, that was a front runner, uh, you know, that that would have made a big difference. Let's let's be positive. Let's look at good things, and a really good thing is this new job with Williams. You are the works historic driver. I mean, yeah. boy, oh boy, what a... Talk about writing your own job description. <laughs> what it's a, kind of what I did, really. <laughs> what a toy box, though. Yeah, I mean, look, Jonathan Williams is a, is a very good friend of mine and has been for many years. He's, he's got tremendous passion for the sport, yeah. uh, has a great love for the sport and obviously for Williams. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's not involved day to day with the race team and the right. Formula One program but he has a lot to offer to the historic program. And I think um, the, the idea is not just to drive the cars every once in a while, which is the fun part. Uh, and of course, it's what I love doing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, because Johnny and I are friends, I, I'd like to work with him to try and grow it as a yeah. business. Yeah. You know, I look at what Ferrari Cliente have done, and that's a gold standard really yeah, for amazing. what this sort of business should be. Yeah, and I think Clive does a good job with Classic yeah, Team yeah. Lotus. Um, Williams again have a great brand. Uh, there's a good history to it, not quite as long as Ferrari or Lotus, but still a long enough history. No, but a wonderful collection of cars. And a great collection of cars. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, for example, just last week, you know, we we sold a car to a collector in America. Now, part of that process will be, you know, I'll shake down the car every time the car comes to rebuild. I'll make sure it's okay. I'll test it on occasion. I'll do a bit of driver coaching, just help them along because, you know, uh, th this particular gentleman's bought the FW13B, the 1990 car. You know, it's a powerful car with a big <laughs> Renault V10 engine and you can't just drive it. You know, you need to have a little bit of coaching to, before you can get on with it, I think. Um, so, you know, we, we want to try and package it as a full business model. Um, and, you know, we've got people going in on Tuesday to look at a few more cars, you know, some people from the Middle East. So uh, it's about growing the business. What's the, what's the best one you've driven so far? The, I mean, that meant the, the most to you? Well, I drove Nigel's, um, it was actually Ricardo's FW14B, but it's a car Nigel won the World Championship in. That chassis I drove was Ricardo's car, the active suspension magic you know absolutely yeah. magic the one I, the two cars i'd love to absolutely love to drive are the fw 11b uh, which nigel won the 87 british grand prix in or won from that year um the, the big honda turbo um and also the 1993 fw 15c which alan pross won the world championship in yeah. there's a 15c that's gone into car build at the moment so right. i'm i'm come all of my fingers and toes crossed that we can have a go soon um but I, I really enjoy driving Damon's FW18 as well. Uh, you know, the chassis I drove was the one he crossed the line to win in Japan. In Japan. Yeah. Uh, it was very special. And I drove it just before he did. Um, at the, he drove it at the festival, but I did the shakedown before. The engine and the chassis is just amazing, you know, and the sound of it. Uh, you know, I was. 12 years old when Damon won the world championship and I remember I've still got the videos of watching the onboards and the sound of that car and then all of a sudden I was driving it and I was like yeah. wow it sounds the same it absolutely you know, I waited to hear Murray Walker's voice over top on the top of it um, very special you must also have thought oh so this is what a Formula One car can be you know no I think you know it's easy to knock the modern cars but I think they are obviously very good I think the, the modern cars 
uh, one of the big issues they've got is the drivers have to underdrive. You yeah. know, the tires don't allow them to lean on it all no, the way through the Grand Prix. Sure. It's a lot of tire saving. Um, but the cars themselves, you know, they are yeah. horrendously impressive. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I drove um, a couple of months ago. I was doing something for Red Bull, and I drove Sebastian Vettel's. I think it was a 2011 championship winning car. Um, it was the RB8, so it must be 2013, yeah. uh, perhaps. I think it was 2013. Anyway, uh, it was a car you won the championship yeah. in. And it was a Ricard. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is a proper car. Uh, you know, the Boulogne diffuser and all the rest. Yeah, it was yeah. just impressive. You've always loved the history, haven't you? It, yep. And it's, it's so Goodwood is Goodwood's a good place for you to be. Yeah, I mean, it's a funny one because I think I'm, I'm a, the revival, I'm still a little bit lost. Because my, my sort of real love for the history of sport comes from the, I'd say probably the 70s and 80s. You know, I was only born in 84. Um, I, I, I won't pretend to know a whole lot about the 50s and 60s. I know a reasonable amount, but not not as much as, as many other people. Well, uh, it was very dangerous for a start. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I've been fortunate to spend time with people like Sir Jackie yeah, and yeah. You know, Sir Sterling and things like that. And, uh, so I have a great deal of respect and admiration for it, but I can't say I know a whole lot about even the cars that I see out there. Um, but I enjoy coming to the Revival because I get to drive things that I wouldn't ordinarily get to drive and race. And it's nice to catch up with people. Right, so today you have been out practicing yep. in the Austin A35 yep. with all of its 84 brake horsepower <laughs> yes. and you had all of 15 minutes. Yeah. So give us give us an idea what would you, uh, what it was like out there. Tell well, us. Something. First of all, I didn't read the timetable right because I thought it was half an hour, but apparently the race is half an hour or twenty five. I don't know. Anyway, but um, I was kept driving around trying to find a gap, and the checkered flag came out. So <laughs> it was a little bit confusing. Um, it, it was it was funny. Uh, I mean, I I didn't. Re I'll be perfectly honest. I didn't even know what an Austin A thirty was before um, yesterday. I was as, as we were leaving home I said to my wife I ought to really google yes, and I see what a picture of the car looks like so I can find it in the paddock really so um, and then I saw it I don't know 15 minutes before the session so uh, it was a bit of fun um, very different um, you know I, I raced a mini last year and I've driven an e-type and things like that here before so yeah. um, this one was definitely the least powerful car I've driven yes, here but it was great fun, and it's you know so it's just nice to be on track with friends. You were out qualified by David Coulthard, I have to tell you. Uh, I believe so. So we'll have to uh, correct that in the race, really. <laughs> okay, so uh, f it's just fun, though, isn't it? I mean, it's for, it's for entertainment. Yeah, I mean, look, y you know, I know the touring car boys take it very seriously, and they've been here testing, and they've all built their super duper cars, and I saw them coming flying past me. But you know, to me, this is a weekend about you know being safe having a little bit of fun, don't do anything silly, and uh, give the car back to the owner in one piece, yes. as he expects. <laughs> um, we like predictions on television, don't we? So let's have one now. Is it going to be Nico or Lewis? For the World Championship? Yeah. Oh, it'll still be Lewis. I, I think, I think you know, Nico's come from having a 43-point lead. At one stage, he was down 19 points. Um, you know, Lewis is mentally very strong now. You know, he had a bit of a wobble back in 2011-12, but he's mentally in a very, very strong place. He takes the knocks, water of a du like water of a duck's back yeah. nowadays, and you know he's just so, so fast. You know, he's had problems with the starts. There've been five occasions this Maybe year. He can't afford to have any many more bad starts. No, it's true. Um, you know, he's had five occasions this year where he's been on pole and not led yeah. out of the first corner, and. and and you know Nico's capitalised on those on most occasions, but you know Lewis is a very very good fast racing driver, and uh, I'd still put money on him. Okay, and here's just to put you on the spot, as you are a Williams driver, who is replacing Felipe Massa? Oh, it's not really my place to say. Really, that's a question for Claire. But, uh, okay, who do you think it might be? Uh, I think there's a young Canadian lad who's le leading the Formula 3 championship who I hear is one of the favourites, but uh, I'm sure it's an open market. Should have been a diplomat, shouldn't he, really? Anyway.
Thank you very, very much. Always your, a pleasure. Your time. We look forward to seeing you in Singapore. Yes, thanks, Rob. Okay. Thank you, everybody. That's, uh, that's it for now. We'll be back uh, here in the Rolex Drivers Club at the Revival. Uh, very soon, we'll have uh, Jean Alesi with us. So uh, we keep going. The names keep rolling in. See you later. They won it. 2010. Here we go. Here we go. A pat on the back for oh. McGuinness. Through they go. <laughs> How close do you want it? A pat on the back. Come on, McPint. Get your finger out. Get Steve, look at this. Look at this. A pat on the back. 